you will hear part of a lecture on art history. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 10. In the last lectures, we looked at the art of the ancient Egyptians and then considered the art of other ancient Mediterranean civilizations, in particular Greece and Rome. We're now going to return to Egypt to consider a set of very unusual pictures known as the Fayum portraits. The Fayum is a lush green area about 100 kilometers west of Cairo. Following the conquest of Egypt by the Greek warrior Alexander the Great in 332 BC, large numbers of businessmen and officials who had come over from Greece settled in this fertile region with their families. They gradually adopted some features of Egyptian culture, including the practice of mummification, embalming the bodies of their dead and wrapping them in linen bandages in order to preserve them as mummies. The name actually comes from an Arabic word meaning an embalmed body. These newcomers made one distinctive innovation, though. After binding the mummy, they laid over the face a picture representing the person inside. The portraits look like oil on canvas, but they were actually produced using a technique called encaustic, where the artist applies pigmented wax to a wooden board with a small spatula. The Egyptologist William Petrie, who discovered many of these mummies with their accompanying portraits at the end of the 19th century, was convinced that they were actually done in the lifetime of the subject, rather than being painted after the person's death, as had been the case with older Egyptian paintings. He felt they were very different from the traditional stylized images that had been used on Egyptian mummy casings in previous centuries, and was convinced that they were actually portraits giving a realistic depiction of the person. He pointed out that the boards on which they were painted showed signs of having been cut down to size to fit within the mummy bandages. To him, this suggested that they may have originally been larger and been hung in the houses of the owners during their lifetimes. But more than a century after they came to light, nobody knew how far they were really depictions of real people, as against idealized portraits. Then a team from Manchester University decided to find out by recreating the faces of Fayum mummies in clay and then comparing the reconstructions with the portraits. The team was provided with skulls from two Fayum mummies from the British Museum and given the information, based on x-rays and other evidence, that one of the mummies was of a 50-year-old man and the other was a woman in her early 20s. Armed only with this information, they set to work. First, they created copies of the skulls, then they used clay to build up the facial muscles in order to reconstruct what the person looked like. After weeks of painstaking labor, two faces emerged. Only then were the two portraits revealed so that the match between the reconstructions and the portraits could be examined. In the case of the man, both model and portrait showed a broad, flat face with a slightly hooked nose and a fleshy mouth with broad lips. But the man in the portrait was noticeable for his five o'clock shadow, the beard beginning to grow around his chin and on his cheeks. This would have been quite a recognizable feature of the man in real life, and an easy thing for the painter to copy. However, it wasn't something that the makers of the model could know about. In the reconstruction, the right eye was slightly higher than the left, and this was the same on the portrait. But on the portrait, the eyes were very large, which is standard with many of the Fayum portraits, while in the model they were longer and narrower. The portrait of the woman appeared to be even more of a standard type, with her large eyes, straight nose, and small mouth. 
these pretty feminine features suggested this could be an idealized woman's face, and yet it proved to match the reconstruction surprisingly closely. The proportions of the lower face corresponded, and so did those of the forehead, though in the portrait the eyes were closer together and larger than in the reconstruction. And in both cases, the head was set on a solid neck, suggesting a more powerful physique than you might have expected from these delicate features. So, overall, the similarities between the portraits and the models are too close to be accidental. The artists may have started from a standard picture, but attempts were made to modify this to reflect the characteristics of the subject, what gave the face its personal qualities. Obviously, this isn't much of a sample upon which to judge an entire genre of portraiture, but the researchers are convinced that, on the whole, the artists aimed to represent their subjects as they appeared in real life, whether this was flattering to them or not. The end of section one. Section two. You will hear an extract from a radio program for people who live abroad. Listen and answer questions eleven to seventeen. You're listening to Expat News, a weekly broadcast for the English-speaking community in this great city. In today's program, we'll be hearing from Tom O'Hara, who's going to tell us about all those different associations he can join. Tom. Good evening. Yes, in a city with so many of its residents born outside the country, it's hardly surprising there's such a huge range of expatriate clubs and societies. And many of these, of course, are aimed at English speakers. So, first and perhaps most obviously, we have the sports clubs, which in some cases field teams in things like rugby and tennis that compete against clubs in other parts of the country or even abroad. You don't have to play at this level to have fun, though. They can be just a great way to do some exercise and, of course, to get to know other people, especially if you're new in town. The same can be said of the many hobby and interest clubs that have sprung up here. Everything from landscape photography, such as the Viewfinders Club in the Harbour District, or focus on the airport road, to old favourites like stamp collecting. Remember that this country has a long tradition of unusual and perhaps even eccentric societies, so there should be something for everyone. A place where you can meet people of different nationalities with the same social and/or cultural interests as you. For those who may be interested in rather more than just friendship, there's a wide range of lively social clubs. Several singles associations organise dancing of various kinds, while for people in a real hurry, there's speed dating, in which everyone talks to everyone else for just five minutes. Then at the end. They decide which of them they would like to meet again by ticking their names on a list. In complete contrast to these are the many religious associations, reflecting the diversity of faith groups present in this multicultural city. Many of them, of course, have their own places of worship. Perhaps also of interest to those who've come here from other parts of the world are the international and cultural societies. These often provide a meeting place for people from a specific country. China, for instance, and particular ethnic groups such as Afro-Caribbeans. As in other major cities, we have here local branches of many charities with names familiar around the world. 
Meetings of human rights organisations like Amnesty International are held regularly in English, as are those of environmental groups such as Greenpeace. All funds raised, by the way, go to the same kinds of good cause as they do in other countries you may have lived in. Inevitably, perhaps, there are also the political clubs, often connected with a particular party and, indeed, a particular country. So we have, for example, a local association of Republicans linked to and campaigning for that party in the US, and Liberal Democrats here doing the same for their party in Britain. Finally, on a lighter note, there's plenty to choose from in the performing arts. Whether you enjoy taking part or just watching and listening, you can take your pick from a whole range of groups. To take just a couple of examples, there's light opera at the Memorial Hall in the city centre, or a very lively amateur theatre company in the Park District. In summer, they give open-air performances of Shakespeare plays, free of charge. Section two. Now answer questions eighteen to twenty. I should mention at this point that clearly some districts have a higher concentration of English-speaking clubs than others, and that certain parts of town tend to specialise in particular activities. An obvious example would be the number of water sports clubs down near the river. Whatever the number, though, they usually have one thing in common, with the exception of a few associations linked to particular countries and supported by their embassies here. In the vast majority of cases, it is the individual members who fund them, so an entry fee or a subscription will be charged. You may be used to council-subsidised sports centres and the like in your home country, but I'm afraid that's not the case here. Assuming you can afford it, then you can be fairly sure that somewhere out there you'll find a club that caters for your own particular fascination. If it's very important to you and you intend to spend a lot of time on it. It might even determine which district of the city you decide to live in. In the unlikely event that you really can't find such a club, the solution is to try to persuade friends and anyone else you meet of the need for one. You could also use the local small ads on the internet to suggest the idea. You'll be amazed at just how many people share even the strangest interest. Then you can start your own. That is the end of section two. Now turn to section three. Section three. You will hear a conversation between two students and their professor, who is asking them to organise a panel discussion for an upcoming conference. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-three. Listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-three. Come in and sit down, Louise Stewart. I suppose you're wondering why I've asked you both to come here today. Well, we've heard rumours. Forget the rumours. I'll get straight down to business. You know that I'm organising a conference on seventeenth-century English literature. Yes, but well, I've arranged for three keynote speakers, and I've invited twenty-five panelists so that we can have five panel discussions. And I want you two to organise one of the panel discussions. But we haven't done that before. Is it like a team presentation? No, the purpose is quite different. In a team presentation, the group presents agreed-upon views, as you have both done at the end of a group project. Yes, 
Well, in a panel discussion, the purpose is to put forward different views. We want to expose the audience to several different viewpoints at the same session. It can help the audience evaluate their own positions regarding specific issues, and if it's well conducted, it's usually more interesting than a single speaker forum. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 24 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 24 to 30. And what exactly do we have to do? Well, you'll take the role of leader or moderator and assistant. Is that like the role of chairman? Yes, that's it. Sounds daunting. Not at all. I've already done a great deal of the preparation myself. Let me run through the procedure with you. I've singled out an issue that will entail quite some conflict of opinion. I've selected panellists who are well informed and will probably have contradictory points of view. That's very important, you know. Actually, I feel a bit nervous. How many panellists will there be? Well, I've invited five panellists for each panel because that's probably the maximum number that an inexperienced moderator can handle. But don't worry. I always invite more than we need, because you can be sure someone won't be able to make it, so you'll probably just end up with four, which is a very manageable number. Oh, I see. And I've chosen a moderator. That's you, by the way. Ah, but Stuart will help, right? Yes. I'll get on to timekeeping and whatnot shortly. That's where an assistant is indispensable. But what procedure do we follow to conduct the panel discussion? Don't worry. I was just about to say, I've also settled on the format. What is it? There are various formats that can be followed, but I've always found this one to be very effective. Yes? OK. Make some notes on these guidelines as I run through them and ask me questions about anything you don't understand. We're ready. Firstly, the moderator introduces the topic and the panellists. But we don't know who the panellists are. Don't worry. I've prepared a short biographical introduction for each one of them, and I'll give you that information tomorrow. Oh, good. Next, the panellists are given a set amount of time to present their views on the topic. I'd say about two minutes each should be sufficient. Now, this is where Stuart's timekeeping is going to be important. You have to keep to the schedule all the way through, because the lecture room has only been booked for an hour. How do I indicate when the time is up? You stand off to one side of the panel, either with your back to the audience or hidden from the audience, but in full view of the panel and moderator. You have a digital clock or timer, and you hold up the appropriate number of fingers to give the number of minutes. When the time is up, you make a cutting gesture with your hand. Ah, but what if the panellists keep talking? Then that's your job to politely intervene and move on to the next segment, which is the discussion itself. Panellists discuss, ask questions, and react to the opinions of other panel members. This, of course, is their primary function and should occupy about 60% of the allotted time. Stuart will watch the time, right? Yes, because you'll be making brief notes. Why? Well, when the time's up, the moderator shuts down the debate and provides a summary of the discussion. Oh, and then it's over? Well, no. The secondary function of the panel is to answer questions from the audience, and that should take up the remaining 15 to 20 minutes. It's the leader's role to recognise appropriate questions and reject those not related to the subject. During the question period, you must maintain strict control, and this will most likely be the toughest part of the whole job. Oh, dear. Stuart will, of course, help you here by ensuring that as many people as possible have a chance to ask their questions and that no one member of the audience tries to dominate. With about five minutes to go, he'll announce that there's time for only a couple more questions, then announce, last question. And then it's over? Not quite. 
you still have to acknowledge the involvement of the panellists and invite the audience to thank them with a round of applause. Should I clap too? Yes, you should both take part in the applause. That is the end of section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 4. You will hear a lecture on time. First, you will have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. The subject of this series of lectures is horology, the science of measuring time, and we'll be looking at a few basic concepts in this lecture. The measurement of time has come a long way since ancient times. It began with such devices as the sundial, where the position of the sun's shadow marked the hour. Daylight was divided into twelve temporary hours. These temporary hours were longer in the summer and shorter in the winter, simply because the amount of daylight changes with the seasons. The earliest sundial we know comes from Egypt. It was made of stone and is thought to date from 1500 BC. Sundials were used throughout the classical world and, with time, evolved into more elaborate devices that could take into account seasonal changes and geographical positioning, and reflect the hours accurately, no matter what the time of year. This was quite an achievement in technology. Today, sundials can be seen as decorative pieces in many gardens. In the 11th century, the Chinese invented the first mechanical clocks. They were large and expensive, and certainly not intended for individuals. However, this is the type of clock we are familiar with today. There have been many developments in clocks and watches since then, and they have been greatly improved. But if your clock or watch makes a ticking sound, then it could well be based on the mechanical movements the Chinese developed a thousand years ago. However, timekeeping has moved on from the mechanical clock. Time has become so important that there is a series of atomic clocks around the world which measure international atomic time. Even though many countries have their own calendars, globalization has made it essential that we measure time uniformly. That we know, for example, that when, that when it's 6 a.m. in the United Kingdom, it's 2 p.m. in Beijing. This standard was set in 1958. Now these atomic clocks are situated in over 70 laboratories all over the world. There is so much to cover about the development of time measurement that I would like to refer you to the reading list. The core text is The Development of Time, Theory and Practice, but there are many other useful texts. A good grounding in the subject is given in Understanding Time by J. R. Beale. Although some sections lack detailed analyses, it does offer a good foundation. Also, Time, Concepts and Conventions is quite a useful read. You might think from the title that it's about the philosophy of time, but this isn't the case. Rather, it gives a good description of how different countries have different approaches to time in terms of calendars and days. Lastly, The Story of Time by David Harris analyses time in great detail, and I would recommend this book if you are aiming to specialise in horology. Now, we're going to continue with an in-depth look at lunar and solar cycles. That is the end of the listening test. You now have half a minute 